debate they had on the concept of state capitalism, which I will address shortly. The third part consists in my contribution also to the debates around unfree labor with the concept of super exploitation that was recently developed by the British economist John Smith, which I think uh, I was the first to apply to Nazism and I think it has great explanatory potential in order to uh, correct all the strands of the critical theory, which I mentioned above, and which I think they are also uh, more contemporary in the way that they can explain where the pressure came from uh, to use unfree labor in an absolutism. <laughs> And uh, I, I, I'm really uh, sorry to, to interrupt you, but we have the only problem is persistent and quite pronounced. We can hardly understand what you are saying, and uh, well, you understand that that's, that's important. Uh, so, what can we do? I, I'm not a technical expert, but uh, I was suggested to say to you that uh, maybe. All other uh, uh, present at uh, the event uh, should, uh, should uh, maybe uh, use, uh, mute themselves as public. Uh, and uh, you yourself, uh, you are kindly invited to speak much more slowly. Okay. Uh, well, if there will be a problem of time, if you give me more than half an hour because of that, you will be allowed to have more time, but it's, it's important that you understand what you are saying. In this moment, we had really hard time to understand what you were saying. So let's try another time, uh, maybe from the beginning, because in fact, uh, we will not follow you. Okay, okay, okay. So I will speak a little bit more slowly. I hope this is okay. And um, I please ask the commission to let me know if you have audio problems so that I can slow down a little bit more. So that is not a problem. Uh, so once again, thank you to everyone who, who is in attendance and who, to, to the commission for letting me defend the doctorate. Um, I will repeat what I just said. So the doctorate has three main parts and three main aims. The first is reassessing the critical theory, the mainstream critical theory, with uh, emphasis on Pollock and Horkheimer. The second part is about the other Frankfurt School, uh, so-called because their members are not that well known today, Arkady Kurland, Otto Kirchheimer, Franz Neumann, and the Marxist economist Henrik Grossman. So they debated uh, on 1941 uh, the concept of state, state capitalism and on the debate world about around the political economy of the German Nazism. So uh, I will return as to what makes them important today. Uh, this is just the structure of the PhD now. So the third part, I uh, address unfree labor debates with the concept of super exploitation that was recently developed by a British economist called John Smith. So in my view, I think this concept can provide a lot of explanatory power to the debate uh, took place in the uh, a baby in the background. <laughs> some baby wine in the background. So I'm not sure what happened. Okay, so now it's gone. Um, I will proceed. Uh, so anyway, I think that the other critical theory, which I'll address shortly, has uh, the potential to explain where the pressure came from to use unfree forms of labor in Nazism, and that is from technological change, another concept which I will outline um, shortly. So uh, these are the three main uh, parts of the doctorate, and also it has an introductory chapter where I shortly address what I'm doing and what I'm researching and what I'm not. And it is important to stress that I am not providing a new theory of German fascism. And I have devoted the entire introduction to just to explain that purpose. So what I'm really doing is taking elements from this other Frankfurt School and critical theory uh, and, and seeing if I could develop something that uh, has not been developed there before, and that is a sort of explanation as to 
how we conceptualize unfree labor and forced labor within the Nazi economy. So that that is for the basic structure. That's what I just wanted to say. The whole PhD is devoted to correcting it, and that is uh, what I am doing. So I will proceed with the second part from the other critical theory now, and with the first part because they are linked together with this debate. Uh, that took place in 1941 on the political economy on German Nazism. Then I will address the third part and for the conclusion of my presentation I will present some counter arguments to the critiques I uh, got and offer also some my personal critiques of myself, so, so I have some self critiques for the conclusion and then I hope that will be uh, enough for the discussion to take off. So once again, thank you and thank you for letting me present the PhD now here. So, and I'm sorry that we have this audio troubles and the like. So uh, there is something called this other critical theory, which I mentioned. So that's the other side of the Frankfurt School. That's not that known. This is Arkady Gurland. Um, Franz Neumann, Otto Kirchheimer, and the completely forgotten Marxist economist, Henrik Grossman. So, in 1941, they debated the political economy of German fascism with Adorno, Pollock, and Horkheimer, and they debated both empirical and theoretical issues, which is not a common occurrence, uh, and in a way, Marx, the debate is fairly unique. Uh, I will address what they debated shortly. Um, the importance also of the debate is that it influenced the Nierberg process. So Franz Neumann, who was also a lawyer within the SPD in Germany, before the war he conjured up the category of economic war criminals for the monopolies of the Reich. And uh, in those way it influenced the debate also influenced post-war history. Uh, Marcuse also developed a list of Nazi industrialists, but this all got sidelined and it was dropped. So if they would have influenced the Nuremberg process um, more than they did, we would also have a different post-war history because of the debate. So that's quite interesting. And also uh, Friedrich Pollock even met with Franklin, Franklin Roosevelt. So the stakes of the debate are high. So that's what I wanted to say here. And the debate itself was about the primacy of the political versus the economical in Nazism. And it was centered around Pollock's use of state capitalism. So what makes the other Frankfurt School important is that the way that they criticized Pollock's use of state capitalism and the, the idea of a totalitarian state is not only based on empirical material, but also through the notion of imperialism and technological change. So that's how they criticized the totalitarian state. The idea was that some of the monopolies, at least one factor of what uh, came to be as uh, a cause of a transition towards Nazism in Germany, was that the huge chemical combines such as IG Farben and Winterskull and, uh, and the like, so these are historically important examples, uh, the chemical processes that they developed actually uh, involved more and more a call for state intervention to take place because they could not uh, inf influence and finance uh, the processes themselves because the technological change that involved in that was involved in the uh, creation, for example, of synthetic rubber, buna, and uh, synthetic gas, gasoline that was important for political autarky in Nazism, which is kind of also a thing which connects the political sphere had to happen with state intervention. And also the setting, of course, was important and I outlined in the PhD. I gave a couple of just historical contexts that this happened also after the crash of the Wall Street, after Versailles and the like. So credit wasn't available. So export wasn't available. And you have all of these uh, counter tendencies to words, for example, the breakdown of capitalism to use uh, Henry Grossman's terms, which I will also debate, uh, you, had, you had less and less of them. So you needed to make yourself close if you were a monopoly to uh, the state, state regime and also the particular compounds that they were producing made them more susceptible to the Nazis than uh, the other political options. This is 
simplified because we don't have much time, but I can go into this in the questions, of course. But this is how the other Frankfurt School, Arkadi Urland and Franz Neumann, at least criticized the idea of totalitarian state. And the idea was that if there was a technological process inherent into the already capitalistic and monopolistic industries in the Weimar Republic, then the same dynamic, if it continues in Nazism, is also a way of impairing the logical consistency of the idea of the totalitarian state. And why they did this? It is because they wanted to counteract this notion of Friedrich Pollock that in state capitalism and Nazism, allegedly no economics takes place. Prices are just symbols, the investment is only state directed, you don't have any sort of uh, private initiative. So uh, this is, was a way of them to answer what we know as the mainstream Frankfurt School uh, from, from Friedrich Pollock to Horkheimer, who developed this concept in his authoritarian state, to Donald, who also participated in that, in that and also uh, in a way framed what critical theory uh, meant during that, uh, that period. So that was important for that reason. And also historically, these, uh, the other critical theory, uh, Gurlan and Neumann, they have been historically confirmed. Uh, Rettel also wrote a similar argument later, but also theories like Thomas Parker Hughes after the war and Latzel Vasmil, otherwise known as Bill Gates' favorite economist, actually recently wrote again on the issue of how these technological processes determined the way that the monopolies took forward within the Reich. So I'm saying this is simplified a bit, but this is their argument. So on the one side, you had historical analysis. On the other hand, you had Henry Grossman, whose work on Marx's method has been able to explain this through the idea of a rising organic composition of capital and the tendency that in the higher levels of accumulation, there just, uh, cannot, there has, there just cannot be sufficient enough capital in the company itself in order to continue its expanded reproduction. So uh, to put it like that, um, retrospectively, and this can actually solve one of the problems of transitions toward Nazism historically. And as I said, they have been confirmed. But what's also important is not that they just developed this out of the blue, but that this threatened another paradigm, the one we know today, of Paul Clark, Amelia, and Dorno. And this is precisely the concept I spoke of, state capitalism. And what's interesting in, in that is that by the idea that somehow Nazism uh, left out political economy, now violence became the determining force. Pollock was actually following Rudolf Hilferding, who I, I don't know if this was written also before, but influenced the Frankfurt School a lot. So uh, with this particular notion of leaving out the political economy from uh, the analysis of Nazism. In the end, this debate divided the school and the other critical theory got left out in short. So moving to the first part, uh, because this was the second one, and uh, I wanted to make a sort of introductions. Uh, this is actually what I saw as a conflict of two, two different paradigms. So usually this is interpreted by almost all biographers as bad personal relations, uh, financial due to financial constraints and the like. So Wiggers House, Stefan Muller, Don, John Abramite, uh, they all interpret that, the debate in this way. Martin Jay says the mainstream school was never serious about economy, while Ritzert says the economic analysis were not the thing of the Frankfurt School. So this is where I kind of differ from them. And I also offered uh, the idea that, that the debate was actually uh, influenced by how they conceive of political economy in the first place. And it is not true that uh, Pollock and Horkheimer did not have a political economy to rely on. They had, and it was inherited from Rudolf Hilferding. He was the finance minister of Weimar before the Nazis, and he was the one who falsely allocated that the monopolies would precisely become the basis of a transition towards socialism. The same monopolies did in the end uh, finance na the Nazis. So it is also, of course, this is a point of debate, but I'm just summarizing his argument here. And basically, uh, this is also what, uh, in his later writings, which are also not that well known, led him to conjure up the idea of a totalitarian state economy that functions without, uh, without any political economics. 
and that everything is based on violence. And in the end, he disavowed any sort of Marxism, but continue the, to omit monopolies from his uh, analysis. This was what uh, Pollock inherited. This was what Hockheimer inherited. And I think this is one of my original contributions in outlining this uh, paradigm and what, why it clashed with this other critical theory. So my, in a nutshell, my take on this is they had uh, different takes on what political economy and what Marxism is. So in the end, this influenced how they would ana an analyze Nazism. And uh, I think this was not, this was never done before like that in terms of offering an idea that these are two paradigms actually. And the notion that he'll put influence Pollock in that way, I think that I, at least I haven't saw anything written on that before. So that, that's my contribution in this sort of uh, field. And what's interesting is that retrospectively, we can see that the first paradigm, the Hilferdingian and Pollockian paradigm of state capitalism, cannot solve the problem of transition towards Nazism because it simply presupposed that out of the blue a totalitarian state economy appeared and suddenly they cannot solve um, the idea as to why crisis became uh, symbols, is the idea how the state manipulates everything into existence. Uh, they, Paul even speaks that it's an endless economy if it acquires uh, uh, sufficient amounts of resources that the Nazi economy can go on just like that. This is a mirror of Hilferding's argument and I think that just never got resolved in the end. Uh, it was, the debate was ended, of course, but it was never resolved. And also on page 149 of the PhD, I think it is also important to remember, I do not criticize the Frankfurt School for failing empirically only, but also that it, it fails its internal tests as well. And that's the point, because if you look at Horkheimer's original contributions in terms of it's his programmatic statements of what critical theory is, the idea of political economy is central. The idea that you would have to have a sort of analysis of any transitions to different forms of capitalism is central. And this is where they failed. And my question was, why did they fail? And that's what I tackled in the first two um, parts of the PhD. So the results of the debate were, to me, um, first say 50-50. Uh, in the end, it was uh, ended, but never resolved. But there was, there's a lot more to it, I would say. Uh, you had Grossman uncovering Marx's method, and you had he even attempted to uh, write about fascism, but was, was prevented by Horkheimer. You also had the idea uh, that technological change influenced the transition to Nazism, and this might be a way forward to criticize the theories, different theories of totalitarian state today. Uh, but all of this got sidelined, and I think it has explanatory value. And certainly, um, since it, it ought to have influenced Nirbunga and the like, it also could have had uh, a political value as well. But I would leave it to that. Even after the war, Horkheimer and uh, Dorno was, became skeptical of their own concept of state capitalism. Uh, they disavowed it. So in the end, that kind of proves that the alternative critical theory had more to say than um, the, the unjustly could not because of the ways in which this was debated and it was as a clash of paradigms. Moving on to the third part, um, I also think that in both of these paradigms in different uh, contexts, a crucial element was missing. And this is a Marxist takes on a forms of free, unfree labor in Nazism. Um, so because they debated this in 1941 before, one year before the labor, the huge labor shortage in Nazism and Galait um, Rezaukil's uh, recruitment labor drive in Europe, the largest in history, about 8 million people. So they didn't have empirical material, but also because, and this is the point, of the shift from away from the critique of political economy, what we know is the main current of the Frankfurt School did away with, with theoretical material as well. So did away with its own uh, theoretical potential. And this is where the other Frankfurt School can offer an explanation why on free labor, where the pressure came to use it. It was because of different you know, development of technologies of the rise of the organic composition of capital, to put it in very crude terms, where you had 
uh, and I can also explain this historically in the questions, we had increasing pressure to use forms of labor which could not have been used anywhere else. So uh, in Nazism, you had close to 100% of the labor force not being able to move their jobs. You had different national categories of, uh, of laborers and you have, of course, and concentration camp systems and all the things we can mention in the discussion, that sort of economy uh, was something that it was something that no other economy could provide in terms of profitability and in terms of making labor work in uh, for the companies that were close to the Nazis and to the five-year plan, such as Iger Fabian, which I do take as a historical example in, uh, in my doctorate. So, I guess this is the, the crux of the, crux of, the uh, of the argument, and also historically the profitability in the, in the steel industry, for example, was way beyond anything imaginable in the US and Japan, even, for example, during the Second World War. So I guess that sort of uh, relation got also conferred historically. And also because we exclude forms of unfree labor, um, the majority of what went on on the ground cannot be explained. So we have empirical and historical uh, details, of course, uh, but theoretical, uh, different theoretical currents just in what, what I saw in my view, um, I have a tendency to relegate this to the sphere of extra economic. So and this is not just the Frankfurt School, for example, Lanzas and Ellen Maxine's would uh, also uh, famously consigned fascism as to the field of extra economics. Uh, Maxine Wood even terms this, uh, the Second World War is the last great war between extra economic forces. And I think that's just plain wrong because it does not uh, uh, correspond to what went on on the ground as if the economy suddenly disappeared from you. Uh, and Paul Matik, for example, and Jürgen Kaczynski, a uh, historian, all consigned uh, what went on with labor to the field of extra economics. So this is where the idea of a paradigm come, becomes important because the paradigm gets repeated. So once you leave Marx's theory of value, that, that's it basically. It's as if uh, all what happened has no um, relation whatsoever to any previous dynamics or their change uh, in Nazism. So it's just, it's not an explanation, I would say it's something that unfortunately uh, plagued Marxist uh, thought uh, ever since. And that's, there's a reason for it. I mean, Marx excluded, and this is where I uh, provide my fruit um, contribution, uh, the concept of super exploitation, which was developed by an economist called John Smith. So uh, Marx excluded in his analysis, the selling of labor power below the value of its, uh, the cost of its uh, reproduction. So in a sense, he was not unconscious of the problem, but because of the level of abstraction he was operating on, he excluded the, uh, for example, super, super exploitation and uh, the selling of labor power below it, the cost of its reproduction. So uh, this problem goes all the way back to Marx, uh, so to speak. And this is where the British economist John Smith comes in. He recently developed the idea uh, in his analysis of contemporary neoliberalism and the global production chains, the idea that it's not just uh, unequal change, but also between the countries because of transnational corporations which outsource their global production chains to, chains to peripheral countries, uh, you have labor being super exploited. So you have laborers being paid well below the value of their reproduction. And uh, that's the thing that I guess has a great predecessor in, um, in Nazism. And so what I wanted to do in this third uh, moment of my doctorate is catch up on what the other Frankfurt School was saying about technological change and offer the an explanation of the consequence of of how high technologies, for example, in the middle of Aldora, where you have the production of the world's first jet fighter, the Messerschmitt 262, and the V2 rocket, uh, through, also assembled through different outsourced uh, underground tunnels in Thuringia and Germany, you have the paradoxical uh, uh, connection between high technologies and brute 
labor, uh, which is in literature, for example, Max Spurer also calls it less than slave labor because it was no longer in the interest of uh, the employer to keep it alive. So it was completely expandable. Uh, this is what Retu, for example, also called the, a paradox. So he cannot explain it. So if he just says it's a paradox, we don't know how it happened and why it happened that you have high technologies being assembled by slave and less than slave labor, and he leaves it at that. And at least he outlines the problem. That's why I devoted the last uh, couple of subchapters to him. Uh, and this idea of super exploitation can provide a bridge between technological change and the idea of what pushes, uh, what creates a downward pressure to exploit labor in ways that were unconceivable in liberal capitalist terms. So the, um, the great, so to say, uh, precondition for, for all of this was also the differences in national labor's value power and also the idea that, that labor cannot leave uh, its place. The Nazi labor laws, of course, one of the most unusual, we can talk about them in the discussion, were all preconditioned for that. So I wrote, by the way, a different article, a separate article based on this uh, for, during my doctorate, but it's not in the PhD, so we can also discuss that. But uh, this key concept is what uh, I would argue can explain what went on uh, on the ground because it doesn't impose that it had to have some sort of state plan for it. For example, the extermination for labor uh, or the legal category of conspiracy, which are all points of debate among the historians as well. And I addressed some of them in the PhD and Tourism Mark Will, for example, debate whether there was a plan or, or was not. We, have, we don't have too much evidence. But what we do have from evidence is what went on in the camps, in the middle of Aldor and other camps, which used, which this, where this sort of paradox appeared. And I guess this concept of, uh, uh, I think this concept of super exploitation can explain empirical evidence more without the use of legal uh, the categories such as conspiracy and extermination through labor, uh, much better than the concept of state capitalism or any different uh, super concept that is just applied to the whole sphere of the Nazi economy. So my contribution is to apply this concept to Nazism. And um, the second contribution I might, or the fourth, uh, I might um, briefly mention here is that I guess abstract labor is also necessary for us to see why this was a capital relation. I went on a little bit in the PhD about that but I also uh, confirmed it a little bit later. So uh, abstract labor, for example, was something Pollock, Pollock in his PhD thesis didn't include at all, so he couldn't even pose the question. And it is interesting that uh, I can also, uh, I can also speak about this and the question as to why this happened. But if you come to look at it in the camps, what went on was not just uh, what Marx says, the absolute or the relative uh, increase in surplus value extraction. So it was not just the prolongation of the working day, and it was not just the influence on labor productivity through investments in uh, technology. There was something else, a third form of surplus value extraction that went on here, and that is selling the labor power below the value of its reproduction. And that was what Marx excluded from his analysis and what consequentially got excluded from future analysis as well. So that's also why I thought that this was an inherent uh, error in this sort of other paradigm within the Frankfurt School. So that's how I connect these uh, two different topics. And if you want to analyze this and why this is still a capital relation beyond, uh, even if wages equal zero and go even below as to, uh, is to exploit the labor of her, his or herself up to the point of death and up to the point of extermination, you had to have uh, the idea that, uh, of abstract labor because the social relation holds. So regardless if one laborer or a thousand of them lose the, uh, their wages completely and lose the ability to reproduce themselves through the market or through the selling of their labor power, they still, uh, it is still a labor relation because it is a social relation of abstract labor, which presupposes that exchange is something that needs to happen even when it is zero. So even though the prices are zero, uh, the social relation still holds. So I guess also this is a fourth topic that is worth exploring in future research also as well. And as to the importance of super exploitation, 
or John Smith, the one who developed it, he says that it is basically the only way forward for a renaissance of Marxism today because it is a dominant labor capital relation under neoliberalism as well. So I didn't hear the third part in just now concluding. Uh, but what I did as a contribution was to show that super exploitation uh, has a great predecessor in Nazism and that Nazism is a predecessor to the global uh, labor arbitrage, uh, that is, to the uh, chain, to the shift between high paid wa wage labor to low wage labor that we are living through today and uh, upon which, according to Smith, neoliberalism is based in terms of global production chains. So if this, if you could call this a tendency of illiberal capitalism, then this is precisely one of the reasons why we need a self-reflection of Marxism in this very category. So that's it for the first part. I will just offer a little bit of counter arguments now and then my own self critiques. So one critique uh, said that basically if we want to study uh, unfree labor, there are better places than fascism with, with which I agree there are colonies in unfree, but unfree labor you can find also in the US, for example, as well in the prison labor system. Uh, and the core countries too, including in Europe in Marxist time, but I'm not sure uh, that the numbers and the volume of unfree labor should dictate where unfree labor must be researched. So I don't think necessarily the numbers should uh, tell us something. Uh, and I think what's more important is that theories of fascism depend on this phenomenon. And so uh, I also got asked why it's important to know some people were wrong 70 years ago. Well, some people will also write and it's a completely legitimate research question for me at least to ask why so um, for me it was an issue of different paradigms within the Frankfurt School as I said in the beginning and only one of them fails the test not only of history but also internal consistency and that is on the issue of labor precisely so this issue was what I took as a dividing line also in the end uh, because it's not only a matter of history, but also an internal consensus, consistency of a theory. So after sorting that one out, the main question I asked was what theories can explain and what can in the Frankfurt School course. So that was a proving ground, uh, I guess, for them. And also what's in, uh, very important that this was not Chattel slavery, what was a stake in Nazism, uh, nor some sort of remnant from the 19th century, but a much more complex phenomenon that excluded reproduction, both economically as explaining the doctorate, but also politically by introducing national hierarchies and what uh, Mark Matsover and Gaspar Miklos Tamas called the reversal of citizenship. So I guess this is also uh, an important field we can also debate. So uh, repressive labor laws and the like, and national differences in hierarchies in the value of labor power all contributed to this. So um, that's what, what I wrote a separate article also. So I will leave it to do that and we can uh, do more in the discussion. And also um, this is kind of the answer as to why I wrote on the topic. So uh, there's no, not much literature upon uh, this, upon the critique of political economy in Marxist terms. Of course, uh, despite the hyper production of literature on fascism and reflections of Marx and value theory are kind of excluded. They tend to get excluded. So except from uh, Postone, no one bothered to take Marxism seriously. Uh, not the liberal authors, uh, historians like Adam Tusk, uh, Christoph Buchheim, Schanner, and other historians are not even, which is interesting, Marxism themselves, such as the Neue Marx Lecture, Ishelanda, and Sotraverso, and the like. So they don't engage in it. And for the biographers of the Nazi firm that I encountered, like Peter Hayes, uh, it has basically become a matter of polite etiquette and manners to dismiss Marxism as crude and simple, while Marxists seem to forget that this is a problem uh, for some reason. So uh, I guess I chose a topic uh, in reality no one likes, and uh, that's precisely one reason why I chose it. And I outline why we need still need a reflection upon this regardless as to the current state of affairs. And why? Well, basically because you can't get around the theory of value. It's, that's probably the whole, whole point. And Marxist critical political economy, and just the fascism has to be there because it challenges the way uh, the way its categories works. And without a sort of self-reflection, which I quoted a lot in the beginning, uh, no no progress 
can be made, and that's also what John Smith uh, confirmed with this idea of super exploitation that I think is a uh, huge concept that has a great uh, explanatory power. So for the self-critique, uh, and I think I'm one minute or two away from the end, uh, so I have two self-critiques of myself at this point. Um, one is that I just gave too much weight in the text in the first part because I wanted to be careful and not to offer stupid critiques. So the Frankfurt School, so excuse me for the language, but it's just, uh, I thought it would, it would not be productive to simply said, say that they are wrong because they didn't not have historical material. It's not a critique. And um, so I wanted to see if I could offer a more intelligent critique than that. And I was also staying with Humboldt with people who would uh, regularly criticize me for doing so. And uh, that was a mistake I wanted to correct. Um, so I overdid it in the end. And the second part that uh, I'm sad because I couldn't, um, I didn't write as much as I could uh, in the second part. And um, then I would also like to debate it, of course. And uh, I actually made it the contributions I planned, but it came up short and that was the second mistake that I made and I hope not to make it in the in future research and be able to correct it and not to repeat these same mistakes again. So that, that's for the self critiques. And with that in mind, um, I also asked like myself where I see future potential for future research. Um, so that would be the relationship between abstract labor and unfree labor. So this got raised as, as a question in the PhD, I think it's a, completely valid question, uh, an interesting one, because it wasn't posed because the reception of Marx, and that, that's what I mentioned, Fox PhD, uh, was not including this uh, in, uh, in the analysis of Nazism. So I guess that's one of the ways in which you could uh, pose the question and this, what's the relationship between abstract labor and unfree labor. I talked about this, I can talk more, but that's one, one uh, current of research I would pursue. Uh, the other one would be uh, national differences and super exploitation in Nazism. I, I'll find out. Yes? Uh, well, I would like to hope that uh, half an hour is uh, already gone. The pilot, uh, I, I am not pressure to stop right now, but I would, I would uh, invite you to, to sum up your, your presentation some final phrases and uh, mm -hmm. your vocation to develop your, your uh, well, points of view uh, later on when you will be answering the questions given by you from the members of the commission and here from the public. So please, uh, you have the word again, but at least uh, let's sum up your positions in some yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm at the end, so I won't uh, talk much anymore. So just to summarize, and of course, I'm sorry for uh, uh, taking too much time. Uh, the contributions of the PhD are that I developed this idea of the Hilferdingian paradigm in the Frankfurt School. I emphasize the role of the other Frankfurt School, especially uh, Henry Grossman and uh, Kadi Gurland in the second chapter on a technological change in our free labor which is at least I posed as a question. And I made an all contribution by applying the concept of super exploitation Nazism. These are just the three main points that I would say are my main contributions. I ascribe different weight to them in the thesis, which is a mistake and this is only my responsibility, but in the end, I think that does not weaken the argument. So um, I want to thank you for listening and sorry for taking too much time. So I would end here and thank you. Thank you to Mr. Martinich for this presentation. I will not uh, deny that we had some, had some problems uh, with uh, the audio connection. And hopefully the public uh, were in a better position. Hopefully also, and that's really, really important, uh, you are hearing us uh, better than we had the possibility to hear you. So, uh, because of that kind of problems, I uh, suggest that after hearing the, the, the questions from the commission, uh, 
I propose a 10 minutes uh, rest uh, to maybe to improve the audio connection we have. So that would be of uh, great importance for, 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 for our page, for our purpose. Uh, so you don't, you, you can confirm you are not, you don't have any, any major problems hearing us what we are saying. Uh, I can hear 70 to 80 percent now, so I can hear the words sometimes the connection is bad, but let's say I can hear 70 percent of the time. So, maybe if, if the, the audio is, uh, is uh, good enough, I, I propose to, uh, to get to the next uh, point, next uh, uh, stage of the events, and that the, the commentaries and the questions given by the members of the commissions. I will give the word to the, the distant, to the mutually connected uh, member of the commission, uh, to the colleague Imos uh, Krasovic, uh, if he's connected, if he's with us. Yes, I am with you. Okay, thank you. So, Primoz, uh, the word is yours. Thank, thank you, thank you very much. So, uh, I wrote my, most of my comments were already answered. Uh, towards the end of the, the presentation. And also the, the committee is pretty large, so I will try to be as short as possible. So I have two, two questions remaining after, uh, after the, the presentation. And one, one is, this is the first question. Uh, it's, it's a very general question about capitalism's relation to personal freedom in general to personal freedom and material well-being. Let, let's put it like this. Uh, in a sense, um, uh, what I noticed in the, uh, in the thesis uh, was a kind of a reversal, but not, not complete, but like a beginning of reversal of a perspective uh, um, from, let's say, naive conception of capitalism as capitalism as an economic system that is somehow the, that somehow has a duty to provide wages and reproduction to, to its workers because a lot of uh, a lot of naive criticism of capitalism is uh, but you don't even guarantee or this system does not guarantee full employment or this in this system people are still poor and, and so on like capital cares in a sense and i think historically and ideologically this kind of uh, this kind of attitude from capitalism comes from maybe a historical period that was more an exemption than the norm in the in the whole history of capitalism but if we go to the basics, so this is a very general question or a, a, a comment. If you go to the basics of uh, uh, capital's relation to a uh, labor force, there is nowhere stated uh, that capitalism has to, uh, uh, or that capitalist class uh, has to take care of the reproduction of the workers. And if you take a look at the whole history of capitalism, this was more, uh, wages covering material reproduction, like housing, uh, education, even, even culture and uh, food and basic necessities and so on. This was more than exception than the norm. So maybe this third uh, or extra super exploitation that you mentioned, maybe exists always uh, um, uh, unless in cases, and these are exceptional cases, of lucky coincidences. So this is a relatively prosperous period of capitalism after the Second World War. Uh, and this is a specific, uh, specific historical circumstance that allows large growth rates allow, uh, uh, and specific political situation that allows state redistribution and general welfare and so on. And another lucky coincidence, which is, uh, which is characteristic for Europe, 
but not all Europe, as you showed with your example of fascism and Nazism and their unfree labor, but some parts of Europe in some historical periods developed personal uh, liberties or the political concept of personal liberties stemming from bourgeois uh, revolutions, but where you didn't have this lucky historical coincidence, uh, uh, free labor is not necessarily the norm, like in uh, parts of Africa, parts of South Asia, uh, and so on, and even in European empires outside of Europe in, in the period of colonialism and uh, uh, imperialism. So this was the one question and comment wasn't uh, like this period of uh, free labor uh, coupled with liberal state and personal uh, liberties, not the norm of capitalism, but rather uh, two, not one, but two lucky uh, coincidences. So maybe Nazism is not so exceptional in its use or, or abuse of labor, as was the, like the civilized labor relations that existed for and still exist in, to a certain extent in Europe and some, some other capitalist country. This would be my first question. So if you want to answer right away, I will stop here. Uh, thank you. Uh, that's a great question. I mean, uh, I can, but uh, I heard the commission uh, ask me to uh, ask us to take a break after all of the questions, so I would leave the decision. Huh. Uh -huh. Okay, okay. Then, I, then I will pose the the second question, and and we'll see. Now, the second question would be about the efficiency of uh, now specifically uh, Nazi labor relations, because both in your presentation and in your work, I got the impression that uh, that the system worked. Uh, of course. This is also dependent on the level of abstraction. So if the theory of some system is more abstract, it looks like some parts fit that, or something clicks or works efficiently, that does not if you, if you go to a more concrete level of historical investigation. But, but I think that uh, uh, a lot of Nazis use of uh, forced labor, unfree labor, semi-slave labor, however we term it, was dysfunctional in, ec in economic sense. For example, you mentioned these high-tech fact weapon uh, factories for uh, uh, rockets and warplanes and so on. Uh, there was a huge problem uh, precisely in those fa underground factories with qualified labor. So, so uh, and there was a huge bureaucratic problem from 43 throughout 44 uh, with the logistics of how to get uh, prisoners from the camp to ask them to do uh, or to make them do forced labor in the in the Reich or in the uh, in the German uh, mainland. So in the end, there were no trains. Some, some had to walk from Poland, and 60% died of hunger and cold while walking. And those who arrived were completely unqualified for this this sort of uh, labor. And there was always a tension in the in the SS and between SS and other. Uh, between SS, uh, the army, and other political organs about how many Jews to actually exterminate and how many to put uh, uh, to forced labor. And Speer was one of the uh, economists in, in this. He wanted to preserve as much Jews as possible. But a lot, a lot of very powerful actors were pushing for the wholesome extermination. So this is first part of, of uh, the 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 question i think if you look at it more on the ground level uh, this system was quite inefficient uh, uh, maybe even dysfunctional from the point of view of economic efficiency and uh, uh, rationality a lot of labor was lost either uh, for political fanatism, that is extermination of all costs, that cost a lot of uh, money, resources, energy. A lot of people were uh, withdrawn from the army uh, just uh, to, to, do, to take part in the uh, extermination of, of uh, a labor force. And even when it was used, precisely because it was abused, it was not very efficiently, efficiently used. So even with the use of prisoners, there were constant shortages of, of labor. So this is the first part of the question. The second is, uh, uh, if, we, if we take like this broad 
political economy approach to understanding uh, uh, fascism, specifically during and right before the Second World War, um, there is still something special about Germany to use uh, uh, forced labor in, in the way it did. Uh, because it's allies, and this was also a frequent complaint if you read historical documents from the Second World War from Germany, uh, for example, the uncooperativeness of Italian allies. Italians were not very, uh, very zealous in solving the Jewish question. Uh, they were not exterminating their Jews. They were not sending them to, uh, they, they were basically obstructionists in the, in the final solution. And the Germans were very angry about it. Same with Hungary. Uh, Germans had to send large contingents of SS and high political officers to enforce the, the final solution because Hungary was not doing anything about it. Same with Bulgaria, same with Romania and so on. So none of the allies, although they were uh, right-wing dictatorships uh, and so on, uh, you could call them fascists, but they did not develop uh, uh, like this kind of slave labor or even actively oppose them. Although they were economically speaking in the same position as Germany, like late bloomers in industrializations, losers in the imperialist uh, uh, game and, and so on. Or to take another example, and I will finish with this, Spain and Portugal didn't even enter the war, although they were politically similar or close to Germany, Italy, Hungary, Hungary of that time. So they rejected the whole war economy uh, and industrialization. So these are examples of countries that were all in the same spot, politically, economically at the same time, but developed quite different paths. So, so I don't think there's any kind of one way determinism. So this would be my second comment. Mr. Matkovic, please, uh, before you start to answer to the second question of the COVID, Russia, that's kindly ask you to, to maybe review your uh, level, output level of uh, uh, the audio on your computer mm -hmm. and uh, to lower it a little bit. Maybe it's uh, like maybe the audio problem we are experiencing are uh, caused by the fact that uh, the level of output is too high, please put it on two-thirds two of the scale, so maybe it will hear you better than we did. Thank you. Okay, uh, so if I understood it correctly, I should answer now, yes? Okay. Okay. Uh, so the first question was about capitalism and um, personal freedoms and material well-beings. I completely agree that the 1970s welfare states and the like are not uh, uh, the usual historical uh, levels or, of uh, characteristics of capitalism. So um, I completely agree with that. And that was one of the reasons why I actually wanted to write on this topic to prove that there's uh, this different forms of cap form of capitalism. Which is in no way, um, which is in no way something that that is out of the ordinary. Uh, and uh, one of the ways, and I think this is important to keep in mind, that I was doing it was to take this idea of Marx that you have to have this uh, ideal average, as Heinrich says, and to work on that level to prove that it, even on that level you have sort of, uh, as Marx says in the contribution to the critique of political economy. Uh, and ir irrelevance to the forms of labor used. So it is not just about which form of labor suits capitalism the best. That's, that's not a question. It can function very well with forms of free and unfree labor as well. So that's something that I think uh, also uh, John Smith was putting it uh, as, a, as a perspective. And that's why I used the idea of super exploitation. And he says, for example, but also not only him, but if you look at the uh, United Nations Conference and uh, Trade uh, Commission, the UNCTAD, 80% uh, of the global value chains are now done, uh, transnational corporations are done, basically sent by global value chains. So this is something where super exploitation today appears as the norm. So this is something in complete contrast to the 1970s. And um, 
with regards to this naive perspective, I think that's also a consequence of Marx. So uh, it is not uh, by coincidence or as you put it, by lucky uh, uh, chance that he um, took liberal economies in England as, uh, as his starting point and as an ideal average and as an English economist who combated uh, the remnants of feudalism. So uh, a critique of capitalism would be to point that there's exploitation that there's something a surplus even with free forms of labor and of course Marx was uh, very well conscious uh, of unfree forms of labor and he, he was uh, um, in contact with the abolitionists and, and the US the US also being during the Civil War one of the first places where um, uh, forced labor of prisoners of war and civilians took place so the US Civil War and the US Spanish War. So these are the origins actually of forced labor in that sense, in the sense of wars also. And uh, Marcel van der Linden, I think you mentioned also in, uh, in your critiques, he wrote about the conveyor belt being actually uh, used alongside slave labor. Grossman even wrote about uh, there being factories of the Negroes uh, and slave factories basically. And uh, it's, it's just it's something that was there from the beginning, even if it, was, if it was undergoing a transition. So where I kind of go in with my argument and say, it, and, it says that, and say that it's not something that's just happening in Europe, it's a historical fact that we know that it's happening in Nazism. And even prior to Nazism in the World War, in World War I, for example, uh, it's, it's how we explain it, and that's where the concept of super exploitation comes in. And to view in sort of an addition to Marx's critique, I think the, the, without that, we just can't explain what was going on because uh, it was not just the working day being uh, expanded or the new technologies used. So you have to have that sort of concept, but it was also something particular about uh, this sort of way that you think about free and unfree labor. Without abstract labor, I think you cannot, uh, you know, for example, Tom Brass and Banaji even he criticizes him for not using abstract labor, but both of them, for example, only uh, mention Belgian and French prisoners of war in Germany. So this is, for, for me, that was like um, a limitation, and that's why I did not use the literature. Uh, but also in terms of uh, uh, explaining how and why this happened, it's interesting to know that uh, uh, the Luna factory, for example, in the Weimar Republic even, and before it, uh, it was one of the first to use forced labor in World War I. So this sort of connection between monopolies and unfree labor is, uh, is an interesting issue to explain. And also I think international labor organization was having a um, uh, problem with defining what slave labor is because the tendency was to define it in fixed capital terms. You are owned as a slave and that's slave labor. But for Marxism, where Marx has come and uh, is a good critique, uh, Marx is a good critique, it's to say that labor itself is a spectrum. So you have uh, unfree and free labor almost in, in all countries. So human trafficking, uh, even precarious Job, precarious jobs are forms of unfree labor where you are compelled basically to over exploit yourself without any external uh, coercion. So th this is one form also unfree labor, uh, prostitution another. Uh, so in the colonies, slave labor and racialized labor is also, uh, it also went in conjunction. But uh, how you define what slave labor, there's so many examples that just, uh, I think you have to stick to what, uh, to, to what you research in a way, and that, that's why I did with, with Germany. For example, even in the US, at uh, the height of the legal slave system, you had, for example, you could be a slave, but also lease out yourself if you had to work on some other farm. Or, for example, as a slave, you could get educated and be as a status beyond even your owner, but still be a slave. So what slave labor, it's, uh, I, I guess that sort of depends on what your research. So I wouldn't say there's uh, one global uh, way of putting slave labor and capitalism together. It's more like labor is a, uh, a spectrum and it depends on where, how and why it gets used is, as unfree labor. But as I said, Marx and his contribution to critical political economy, I said it's pretty irrelevant as from the commodity form to what form of labor you use. But I would say you have a tendency and Marx also knows that in the first book of Capital to push the wages down to, to, to level zero. So it's also it's a tendency, whether it gets realized is you have to have institutional and historical configurations to explain that. So I would maybe uh, off the top of my head leave it at that.
but we can also discuss it later on. Um, uh, production and efficiency. Uh, yeah, this is a, an interesting question. I wouldn't say they were just efficient. And you know, there's there's this. I know that so there's some myth that gets reproduced, but um, for example, in Serbia and Yugoslavia and uh, uh, the way slave labor and less than slave labor was treated here was disastrous. Yeah, I, I don't think you could, and there's not even much data as much for put it, I think, uh, we're still compiling it. There, is, there has been recent research on that in Serbia, but the way slave and less than slave labor was treated here was uh, is void of any sort of rational, uh, rationality. But I would say that if you look at what went on in Auschwitz and with the walking examples that you give, that's one of the reasons that Iga Fabian chose to invest in the Monowitz uh, pre Auschwitz camp, basically to over exploit them without walking and uh, take the labor time to the maximum. Uh, what went on was with the system of selection that I outlined in the PhD and the SS, that, that was sort of something specific that, that I guess didn't happen anywhere before and afterwards, that you had whole batches of laborers being replaced and exterminated down to death. So there's a debate whether this was planned or not. There's too little documents to prove it was, but it, it happened. And I guess this concept of super exploitation is what you can use to explain it. But the more broader question you posed, and I think it's the most interesting one, was the uh, relationship between ideology and uh, forced labor. And that's what I want to devote the last part of my answer. So. Um, it's interesting, for example, Adam too says that uh, when you had 1942, the labor shortage and uh, the Gaulai Teresau kills a uh, recruitment labor drive, this made the Jews, for example, appear as dispensable. So except in Ukraine and Poland, where you had more, uh, more significant population of Jews, in the rest of the Reich, uh, they, the, this sort of drive made the Jews appear as, as dispensable, at least to the local SS chiefs and uh, 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 military leaders who could then uh, explain that they're pushing against the Wehrmacht and all uh, the party bureau, the state bureaucracy, in, uh, and they had this idea that they're the racial elite and, uh, and the committed few who would put, push on through the Judeo side, despite the army, despite everything else, and the labor programs made them made this sort of argument more more prone. So that's what Adam too says. But also, you have lead research like uh, uh, Wolf Gruner, who recently compiled the history, I guess, of uh, the Jewish councils, which were put forward by the Nazis to the Jewish community, which also then, uh, for example, in the ghettos until the destruction of the Lodz ghetto in 1944 they used this idea of, sort of uh, forced labor as a way to trade with the SS. So yes, we could cooperate with you, but then just make us work, don't kill us, basically. So that's the argument. And there were 60,000 of such uh, laborers in Germany, I guess, uh, in the beginning of the war. And uh, it was interesting that even the SS itself, as you mentioned with the trains, there was this uh, SS general called Albert Schmelzer who stopped the trains on the way to Auschwitz to take several thousand of Jews to forced labor. So, so there's also, I guess, a constant competition between that, but what I get from Max Pürer and, um, and Wolf Gruner and Adam Tuz and the historians, they tend to agree that it was also a harmonious sort of relation between forced labor and ideology. So the more labor that was recruited, the more you could kill and satisfy and use this as a concession to the racial ideologies of the SS who, so this is not a, uh, not, not a simple solution, but there was something like a tendency towards that, but also the SS was, as you know, conscious of its own uh, uh, commercial empire that it was being built on the precise use of slave labor. So before Auschwitz, Himmler also wanted to get private companies to conscript slave laborers, but couldn't do it. And the yeah, Auschwitz was one of the first examples and also where Liga Fab invested into its own camp. And also recent research suggests it also invested in Birkenau, for example. So uh, I guess this is sort of where you confirm the thesis even more. And uh, what's uh, interesting in that regard is that uh, you have to have some sort of idea where, where and why the SS was doing it. So it was not because of pure uh, wishful thinking but it was because they needed uh, to get the super exploited workers uh, to do something. And, the, the, and I outlined in the doctorate uh, the, the factors 
which influence productivity. So you have a skilled and non-skilled labor also gender play the role. You have the procurement agencies uh, giving the price to the SS. You have the overheads for the guarding, etc. So every all of this influence the cost of labor, and that influence also the productivity. And uh, the, for example, brick workers weren't as productive by um, by uh, like per definition. So different workers and different races and different uh, nationalities, which were ascribed to them, also influence how they work. For example, mortality was high among uh, the Soviet prisoners. Uh, on the top of the hierarchy, you have Germanic uh, uh, nations, such as the Scandinavians and uh, the Norwegians, and uh, then the Romantic people with the Italians that you mentioned. So yes, they were inefficiency, but that's also part of the system, but it was not part of the analysis. Uh, but broadening up the perspective, you might as well say that these sort of contradictions were inherent in that system as well. So it all influenced how and where uh, the, whether the work would be productive. But I have one calculation by Peter Hayes on industry and ideology. He wrote on Ige Faber. Basically, give and take all of these different factors. He calculated that Ige Faber made about 1,000 marks more per worker than it did before 1942. So uh, you could see that with, with all of the differences uh, in labor power and the efficiency, they, they tended to profit off of this. So whether they liked it or not, that happened. So with my, I won't go any more further into detail, but do let me know if I need to expand on any of this. So if I haven't answered any of the questions, then sorry if I'm talking too long. No, no, no. I'm I'm satisfied. Maybe maybe a little bit about this comparison between uh, Germany and other fascist nations, but uh, uh, but just just shortly, so so we can move on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry, I excluded that. So yeah, I chose Germany because it was in the Nazi Reich. It was the core and not the periphery. So uh, that was one of the reasons I did it. And I, as I said in the beginning, I don't offer a theory of fascism and very fascism imaginable and in Portugal and in Salazar and in Spain. Uh, but specifically, I attempt to explain uh, unfree labor through super exploitation that went out as a consequence of technological change while being conscious that being, this is all just one factor out of many, but one factor that was not sufficiently explained in the previous theories that I mentioned. So that's where I give my contribution. But I think you would have to have a really broader perspective to offer a full-blown theory of fascism. So I would not do that <laughs> at this point in my defense. But uh, regarding the other countries, well, you know, in Europe, you have really IG Faben, it was, it was, it, there was no comparison with, with that. So you had DuPont, France, the chemical industry and the international and the imperial chemical industries in Britain, which were competitors to the IG Faben, but there's no such level of advancement in developing technologies anywhere else in Europe. So this is a company that had, I mean, a, con a consortium of six companies, uh, which, are, by the way, are still alive, Akfa, Bayer, and Basf. So the various Basf recently bought Monsanto, for example. So they are still alive. And this is a company that produced 80% of the world's colors. So Indigo and these dyes, they were their yeah. main... So, sorry? Yeah, yeah. So anyway, and they exported 90% of it. So that made them really dominant in the market. And it's, uh, it's not a coincidence that this sort of counter revolution happened in Germany and that sort of slave labor and less than slave labor was used precisely by these companies where you have huge technological advancement and unfree labor from the start of the First World War, which is also, I think, Peter Heis, the historian of the firm, as biographer does not even mention. So I guess you would say one of the explanations why Germany and why it shows it is precisely this relation with high advanced technolo technological development and unfree labor that kind of does not have parallels in all other countries. So I would say that this is specific for Germany and for me that that is the argument because I'm researching that. So I would stop there. Yeah. Okay, back to committee. The member of the commission and the candidate uh, has ended the first one. But before we will continue with the other two set of questions posed by two other members, uh, I, uh, I will, uh, on behalf of the commission, I will uh, interrupt the session because we still 
experience some audio problems here, in, especially the candidate. And uh, uh, in addition, we have uh, also uh, we also get some some complaints by the public uh, here in us, the commission. Uh, in order to ensure the publicity of the event, uh, we must uh, improve, uh, uh, at least try to improve our audio uh, connection. So we will have, uh, I would say. But uh, I will put you a question to, to the audience. We now turned off, uh, off our external microphone. So tell us, please, if the voice is now better or not. Maybe you can use chat. Can you hear us? Is that okay? Uh, I don't think the, uh, the voice is better. Yeah. yeah. I still hear lots of interruptions. Mm -hmm. So what do you suggest? Let's what take a break. Do? Let's take a break and uh, check okay. some for solutions. How, how long will we be the break? I think 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. Okay, thank you. 10 minutes break. Okay, okay. thanks. Hello, Commissioner. Me slyšíte? Yes. 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 Zdaj bi prosila, če se vsedate na svoje mesta, pa je ta mikrofon posebi, ki je dan, priključen na računalnik trenutno. Zdaj bi prosila, da en ta mikrofon vzame, pa ga približa čist k sebi, pa preverimo, če kakšen je zvok. En in vajs, en dva in vajs, en in vajs, en dva in vajs. Ja, ok, reže vas še zmeri. Zdaj bi prosila, če mogoče ta mikrofon izklopite, iztaknete, Peter, vidim, da si ti zraven, mogoče ga iztaknete. Ja, 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 se si iztaknete. Ok, zdaj se vsedi, ne vem, tam ne zraven. Ja, ok. Ok, zdaj tole zelo reže. Zdaj bojim se, da je vse čas računalnik tisti, ki lovi zvok. Jaz bi predlagala, da mogoče za hipec si približeš računalnik. Ali pa se ti približaš računalniku, ja, pardon. Kaj, kabel je do konca, veš, kaj ne vidim, koliko je sistemski zvok tukaj na tem računalniku. Zdaj, ko si tako blizu računalnika, te je slišati v redu. Tako da, če bi bila varianta, da se komisija presede na drugo stran, se pravi tam, kjer je bliže računalniku, in v času, oziroma, ja, in v času, ko zastavlja vprašanje, se postavi pred računalnik, vendar bi rada še testirala to. Lej, zdaj le bom naredil tole minuto. Jaz sem v tem času vse zunanje goste tega zagovora dala v waiting room, tako da niso prisutni. Ja, 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 sedaj. Lej, bom veste, kaj bi malo postavila. Ja. Hvala za pomoč, Petar. Tako je, tako je. Pa da vidimo, tako če se se boš vedeti, če boš ti se vedeti. Tukaj. Tako le, a ne, se bolj sliša, ne? Ja, tebe se zdaj odlično sliša. Ne, ne, čakaj, samo malo. Če bo zdaj Igor tukaj, pa bo recimo tako le govoril, ne? Ja. Se jaz lahko kamero... Potem pa po da naprej do. Ja, nič koraz, da bomo dali pa tle. Ja. Prosto. 
Še ena varianta je, ne vem, lahko poskusimo, da se uporablja te zvočnike in mikrofon, ki ga imam jaz v pisarni, pa da si, ne vem, koliko vam je do tega, da si potem vsak da na glavo te slušalke, pa govori direktno v mikrofon. No, to mora povedati, Ida. Ja. A bi imel na glavi tudi mogoče? A ga lahko enega prosim prineseš? Ja, lej, prinesem in pridem ti ja. Pri čemer bom te jo prosila, da se priklopi s svojimi šem in vas posluša in mi bo govorila čez. Ok, prihajam. Čakaj, zdaj, če bom podan. Kaj pa če ga dajmo tlele, lej? Kole, eden bo tukaj, čist ne bo gavno, drugi bo pa tukaj, pitva se pa ikaj dodatno. A ne, ti se tukaj vsedeš. Kaj tukaj bo recimo pač zvoljiti. Ni te drugi bojo. Kaj ga ne slišiš? Kako? Ne. Kaj pa drugi? A niste dva? Ja, se boste podali. Vas lahko prosim, da zdaj spregovorite bliže računalniku, komisija. Slišimo? Ja. Zdaj poskus pa nekaj govoriti, se malo pogovarjati. Nekaj mi govorite, prosim. Dobro. Vem, če ima govoriti. Bom tole prav obveščal na vas, da bo v četrtek 3. septembra 2020 ob 11. uri Aleksandar Matkovič. Če govorite na tak način kot zdaj, se pravi, malo ste nagdeni proti računalniku, se vas sliši odlično. Ok. Ok. Potem bo se zdaj le posedate počasi, pa bi predlagala, da znova predlagam vsakič, ko bo nekaj zastavljal vprašanja, se posede takole pred računalnik in nagne tudi vanga. Ok. Dobro, zdaj moramo samo še počakati, da se čini. Ja, ja. Vse gre. Izgubili v okolici stavke. Ja, prav. Čim pa se nekdo malo nazaj nagne, tako le zdaj, ko sva se malo pogovarjali, čim se malo nazaj nagne, te začne zvok spet tako električno odmevati v prostorstvu. Aha, spravi prav tale bližina. Ja. Ja. Ok. Dobro, obžalujem. Lahko se dogovorimo tudi tako, da za ta čas izklopim z kamero, pa se predstavite, ko govorite, če vam je to ljubše. Ne, vse je v redu, spravljanje vsega, samo da vem, kakšna oddaljenost mora biti. Ja, ta oddaljenost zdaj je odlično in mislim, da je prej tudi vaš čas računalnik lovil in ne tisti mikrofon, tako da je bil to pravil. Zdaj pa ne bi prej skušala znova, kako se ga vtak ne da deluje. Prav, hvala. Bomo, pa hvala za potrpljenje.
Diva, mi smo skompletirani in lahko vključite ostale iz waiting rooma. Ok, sam še dr. Krašovca bi vprašala, če govori član komisije, tako bo računalnik se sliši dobro, kaj ne? Ja, ja, zdaj se odlično sliši. Ok, zdaj bom jaz spustila, sebe bom zvok izklopila in spustila publiko noter. Srečno. Okay, I think that the defense of Alexander Matkovich's dissertation can go on. We are now 32 participants and uh, the president of this commission, Igor Pribac, uh, has asked me as the next member of the commission uh, to put you the question. Uh, I will short you put a question which I expressed uh, in my written evaluation that you have received, I guess. Um, and uh, maybe partly, partly you have already discussed this uh, issue uh, in the last discussion with Primoz Krasovets, but still, uh, I presented this question. Um, I think that uh, theoretically speaking, you're in a kind uh, exag exaggerating with the use of Karl Marx scheme uh, about the relation between economic and non-economic factors or forces, spheres in the society uh, in, in the way that uh, the economic, uh, the economic uh, uh, factors are always in, in a kind of over-determination uh, uh, against uh, the other factors. Uh, uh, you expressed a critique to the uh, Frankfurt mainstream uh, part of the Frankfurt School, uh, when you say that uh, it has um, overestimated the role of the state uh, in the Nazi regime, and uh, it, has, it, it reduced uh, the critique of, of the political economy of German fascism. But I believe that you made a kind of the opposite mistake so you stressed too much uh, the, the private business initiative in analyzing camp industry, uh, while your view of, uh, of uh, the role of the government uh, is, uh, in my opinion, improper. Um, if I start with, with this system of the camp industry, uh, first I would say that it was very dependent on the partnership with the state repressive apparatus. Uh, the government was delivering limitless amounts of almost priceless uh, labor force. Uh, it cared for it, its disciplining, uh, uh, it, it repressed uh, potential rebellions. Uh, so the governmental repressive apparatus was one who, who was uh, responsible for, for a very, very great reduction of the labor costs in this uh, camp industry system. Uh, and if we take private, private companies in the circumstances of, of the free labor market, they, they would never be, never be able to reduce, to reduce labor costs so much. Uh, we can say that the government uh, enabled an increased profit rate for these private industrial companies. The government was also the one who was buying uh, many products of these uh, companies uh, within the system of the war economy. It, it also defined the prices of purchase. So maybe we can say that uh, the government was one who ran 
the, the war economy and it outsources it only one phase of the whole system. It is the very production uh, to the private industrial corporations. Second, uh, the Nazi governmental repressive apparatus was run by uh, obviously uneconomic uh, motives. Motives like uh, conquering other, other nations' territories, racist, racist mo motives and uh, genocide-oriented motives and purposes. Um, after conquering uh, the territories of Poland and then Soviet Union, the mass killings of uh, the hated nations started without trying to use their labor force before killing them. So uh, it, it was basically a genocidic purpose uh, that was in the first phase of war performed directly. But then later, when uh, the German industry uh, filled lack of, of the domestic industrial labor force, they, they were trying to organize another way of killing when people that were sentenced to be killed uh, went through the system of the camp industry and their labor for force was used for a month, maybe for several months uh, before being killed. Um, which means that uh, uh, certain non-economic motive was, uh, was playing a very huge role. Uh, and uh, strictly economically, I would say that this system of using labor force was not sustainable. Um, what is more, I would say that uh, if your thesis about uh, the system of concentration camp industries uh, is uh, really run by the profit making motives of private German companies, then you, you would hardly ask my question why such a system hasn't happened in other developed industrial nations. Uh, we know that capitalism has many phases. It's not only the system of using labor force, uh, which is free on a free labor market, etc. There is a huge uh, evidence of uh, using forced labor within colonial practices, but uh, the Nazi system was something different from colonial use. Uh, because it was, uh, it was uh, the exploitation of, of the forced labor uh, in, in the camps was actually uh, 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 a specific way how to kill people uh, that belong to, to certain nations, certain ethnic groups. Um, and I think that, again, theoretically speaking, uh, we should check how the specific modes of capitalism, for instance, this uh, uh, camp industry, articulate uh, the usual motive of the private capital companies to exploit labor force with some other non-economic factors uh, which can follow certain ideological, political, cultural purposes, etc. So capitalism is not necessarily liberal one, that's clear, but uh, I think that you cannot reduce the very phenomenon of the Nazi regime only to the capitalist mo uh, motives of private German capital. Okay, uh, thank you. Should I answer now or wait for the also other questions? What does the committee say? Yes, please, I, I, I would suggest you so. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, well, I would actually repeat basically what I said in the beginning and in my replies to, uh, to this sort of critique. Uh, I'm not offering any new theory of fascism as a whole, and so 
I will also devote the entire introduction just for this or so more precisely pages 21, 22, 24, 29, and basically the entire introduction and to say precisely this, I am adding uh, an element called super exploitation to another element called technological change in order to explain what was happening on the ground, not many theory, I don't have a theory of concentration camps, much less of fascism. So that's one thing, but the, these things are worth discussing in, in any detail. Uh, so this being said, I don't speak also of profit motives, I think, uh, nor of, of anybody's motives. I think I excluded that in the introduction as well. What I do speak about is this technological change and accumulation, which uh, helps us explain what's going on without the legal categories of conspiracy or extermination for labor. Uh, German historians such as Mark Dugan, Adam Tuz, uh, argues, for example, that this existed. Google argues that it not. Uh, and also, there's a debate about when actually, in, in what instance, extermination through labor existed because some groups were small in some camps, in other camps, the Poles and the Ukrainians were larger. But uh, you can't say that there has been a lethal intent to destroy them as the people, except for the Roma and the Sinti and the Jews, of course. So it's, it's a it's, it depends on what you're speaking about. And also in uh, this idea that uh, you want to kill certain groups, um, it, it cannot just be applied as a, as a category for everything else. Uh, what uh, I wanted to suggest is maybe to throw an overview of what the thesis is. So I'm not uh, arguing that there is a sort of economic overdetermination that suddenly appears and drives everything else. It's much more co complex than that, that you don't need a PhD to do that or, any, or anything else. So it's, it's not a theory to say something like that. Although towards the end of the world, it has been, according to Hildener and this um, historian, as I mentioned, a sort of economization of labor. Where, for example, even the DSS abolished the Judenstern, so the, the yellow uh, sign, and the uh, IGF have been attempted even to grade uh, uh, laborers in uh, Mittelbau Dora based on their productivity. And this was also, uh, the DSS, for example, rejected that because the DSS wanted some sort of racial hierarchy to still exist which in turn influenced the value of labor power. So you have this political and economic uh, uh, factors being intertwined, of course. And also you had, for example, previously this Leistung Mehrung, the system of performance feeding, which IEG Faben instituted as a way to make workers more productive. So that was something the EEG managers did. So there was something in the economization of labor towards uh, the end of the war that did that really was sort of an economic overdetermination, but I wouldn't say that holds for fascism everywhere and always and, uh, and as such. So there was some tendency, but that's not a theoretical thing. That's a historical fact that there was this pressure to use more and more laborers, but it also went uh, hand in hand with, for example, the idea of an uh, anti Bolshevistic front, a European front against Bolshevism towards the end of the war, where when the Nazis saw they were losing, and that sort of translated itself into different treatment of different laborers. For example, the Italians were considered traitors and, and the like, but also Poles and Ukrainians, they began to have a little bit better treatment in some situation because the a Nazi Europe, as it was supposed to be considered, would involve some sort of coalition between different people against Bolshevism. So you have this ideological element there as well. And also when we talk about the state, it's, um, uh, or rather I'll begin with the SS and come back to this. For example, the SS also had its own commercial empire that it wanted to uh, produce, as I, as I said, but also in the document I uh, devote page 116, 119, 93, and the entire chapter on the SS and racialized super exploitation. So, it's there. I wouldn't say it's only profit driven. I, I would say it's more of a con concession that the SS did uh, towards its own economic interest. And it's also like, uh, it also depends what economic interest and in where, where, of course, because Oswald Paul, for example, the, the Amts group there, which uh, led this commercialization, was also forcing itself. So it depends on what, what section of the SS. So neither is the SS this sort of monolithic racialized sphere and um and also i would add even that the ss and, and with its racism i mean they were not, they were not only racist like ground roots races they were also trained races because they also had this training camp in Dachau where they would be fed uh, nazi literature national socialism discuss its enemies like the jews and the roma and the sinti and the others and the bolsheviks and actually they had the camp regulations which 
pretty much uh, made this into a drill that was constantly trained. And uh, when I say racism, you can you can imagine there are different meanings of what that word means with, for the SS because it was not only ground roots, it was institutionalized racism and the exploitation of the laborers that did was a concession from them to their own different aims. So the SS is also a sort of contradictory um, agency. And it also depends on, uh, on whether they inhibited themselves from profiting from their own economic empire because of their grassroots racism, which did exist even uh, in, uh, the, in their own bureaucracy. So I devote a couple of uh, chapters to subchapters to that, not necessarily this, what I said, but uh, I did devote that to the precise economic system because in the narrow sense of the term, because that's what I researched, that's what I saw that that is that failed to be included in to uh, the theories which said that it was just some sort of extra economic thing. So it also depends on what extra economic is. I mean, if a certain ministry buys uh, or invests into a camp, is that an economic thing? But also if that ministry passes a law, is also that an extra economic thing? Because it's not in the same uh, in the same sense. For example, you had the Nazi labor laws with which um, when it's 1933 and 4, that they called, uh, uh, there was no employer and, uh, and worker. You had now the Betriebsführer, the leader of the factory, and the Volkschaft, the followers. So the workers were the followers, and they had paralegal uh, courts of honor, for example, to regulate them. So you have all of this uh, being, and they were also tied to the workplace. So you have all of this being a precondition for uh, the future exploitation that took place. And I mean, uh, this influences how you think of labor, even because if you would look at the German working class, close to 100% of them could be considered not free by liberal standards because they could not leave their own place. And the racialized hierarchies, the state did, and I agree with you on that, uh, the, the state did um, introduce uh, with the Germanic and the Romanic and the Slovenian and tribes and the Jews being a, holding a, like a, the least place, that sort of legal structure, although it might be considered extra economic, influenced the economic, uh, uh, I mean, I don't divide it along those lines usually, but so to speak, it influenced what went on in the camps as well. But I wouldn't say that this whole thing is just some sort of extra economic sphere that is just outside of our analysis because we don't know nothing theoretically about it. There are concepts which you can use, and one of those is the super exploitation, which I uh, aimed at uh, using to explain one part of reality, not the reality as such, because it's obviously uh, too complicated and too, uh, and too varied to, because you also have the influence of political factors as well, but you cannot uh, explain it as one, with one super concept but you can explain some aspects of this with this one. I use conscious of where that concept fits into what theory. So that's what I did. And um, I heard this criticism, of course, uh, I read the comments. Um, one of the last things I would say is, you know, it depends on what, uh, what you think when you say the state in Nazism, this, because of course, you know that the Nazi party tended to create extra state apparatuses, the ASR, the SS, Gestapo. So these are all part of state apparatuses. And yes, and the, uh, in terms of uh, overlapping authorities, so it was a complete nightmare. So some of my professors on whom the last time I was uh, staying with the Department of History, we're researching the ministries of labor, for example, where you have competing committees everywhere. Uh, it's hard to say whether this was even a state anymore. So in a way, the Nazis also did the withering away of the state, but the, when the state was, uh, when the state would provide legal uh, background into exploitation, such as with the Nuremberg racial laws, then you have the state being used. So I would say that this depends on what the Nazis wanted, what the military wanted, and what the monopolies wanted, and the SS. So I would basically, if I could choose some sort of theory, I would, I would choose Neumann's theory. That's why I also um, mentioned him in the PhD. He, he says basically, and I think this is a confirmed fact, that the Nazi Reich was actually a very fluid structure. So it did not have one state controlling everything, but more a competing, uh, a compete competition of different groups. And that's very interesting because once you talk about the Reich, the usual premise is that it's a state control monopoly economy, but it, it's anything. But you have a competition being repeated on higher levels than before. For example, not only in terms of uh, competing uh, uh, authoritarian, 
uh, uh, sorry, uh, competing uh, overlapping authorities from the ministry, uh, uh, from the Nazi party and the like, and also Speer's position uh, with head of economic groups is also something that's not, not even not that much of a state thing. So you also have these overlapping competitions, but you also have it within the economy as such, uh, they did not have the same command economy as the Soviets, uh, which uh, implied counting the materials and resources you use. Uh, and also, what I would make one small critique, it's would not uh, limitless amounts of labor power. Precisely, labor power was in high demand. And you had 13.5 million foreigners working for the Nazis, according to much further other estimates who would have uh, speaks about 11 million, the bottom two is 50 million. It's hard to calculate them, but you had a limited amount of labor power, not a limitless amount of labor power, and you had to get it from somewhere. And also the gas with 1.5 million uh, dead, uh, 1.5 million intern and 1.1 million dead, uh, a testament that it's not a limitless resource that we have. But these are human beings which were uh, inhabitants of Europe before they were sucked into all of this. But I would say that if you want to uh, speak about this uh, sort of uh, command economy, it was anything but. You had steel orders being accumulated, you have uh, inefficiency all over the place because once you do command economy and once you get into the role of uh, establishing what priorities I may be drifting out a bit here, but I want to end. So when you establish different priorities was who gets more steel, for example, then you also have competition for steel orders in different companies. And that translates into more competition between uh, the companies and the, uh, and the pressure to exploit labor power so they could utilize their resources better, which in turn also uh, translates to a lot of errors on the ground. So I would say that it's hard to uh, characterize the system. I wouldn't say that it's uh, an overarching uh, economic team that drives it, but I would say that if you want to explain what went on on the ground, precisely in the uh, role of super exploitation of the laborers, you have to have this concept to explain it uh, in terms of what went on when this when this uh, technological change uh, went on pressurized to went on to produce the pressure to use this sort of labor power. How that relates back to the state is an open question that depends really on what part of the economy and how, and it was not, and then that's why I use Igefar, but it was a specific example because it was everywhere in the Reich. It was in 13 of the 26 group, economic groups the, the five-year plan had. So it was really a special place and it was very, very influential and that's why I use it. For the other sectors of the economy, for the losers of the competition, that's a whole different story, but I would agree with you that, uh, that there's no sort of over overarching uh, team that, uh, that you could just say it was a capitalist motive, and I don't say that in the PhD. So, but let me know if I need to explain this a little bit better. And sorry for taking the time. Thank you. Uh, Igor. So hopefully we, uh, you, you can hear me right now. I know uh, the, uh, the public also. Um, my reading of your dissertation was, uh, seems quite in line with the one presented uh, in this uh, question by uh, Gorast Kovacic, the previous uh, member of the commission. But uh, yes, partly I, I, the questions I wanted to ask you were, were already answered by what you said, but I will maybe insist in some, some aspects of the, the main, the, the same, let's say, uh, main, main uh, uh, framework um, of uh, the discussion uh, already already established by your uh, exchange of opinions. Um, it seems that it, it's quite often said that uh, the fascism 
offered an alternative uh, way to to modernity to modernize capitalism in comparison with the one offered in the United States by the uh, Ford industry. And uh, well, uh, the, the, the two ways uh, produced uh, what we have uh, right now, uh, but it seems that you're stressing the uh, extra uh, exploitations and the slavery work in the fascist economy uh, goes to uh, goes on and uh, is asserting also that nowadays we are witnessing uh, a still very important uh, role that the labor um, labor economy has in the capitalist. Uh, uh, economy uh, as such and uh, it seems that uh, you are insisting on the fact that the, the residuals of uh, fascism uh, is, are still of uh, primary importance in the anal analysis of uh, the capitalist economy nowadays. I will. I would like to know if you are, if I'm true in saying that, if uh, you are really considering the slavery work in the industrial zones uh, that are not really part of any sovereignty, state sovereignty nowadays in the world, are of uh, primary importance for the capitalist economy nowadays. Is this extra exploitation in slavery work? Uh, uh, and uh, well, maybe consequences of colonialism are of uh, 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 are primary, very important, crucial, or they are just marginal, a marginal aspect of economy, and uh, maybe uh, residual, residual uh, layers of uh, of something that uh, in fact could be. Uh, speaking for a historical point of view, neglected uh, because the other, the other, the other uh, push uh, in the capitalist economy is prevalent, and the other push is, uh, in fact, uh, based on the on the voluntary uh, commission, voluntary. Uh, 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 voluntary uh, aggregation to to the economy uh, of capitalism um, that are that is uh, rented by the vast majority of people around the world, which are uh, happily connected um, on the IT devices right now and uh, are in effect right now to this crisis and we are in fact uh, right now uh, part of this trend um, are, are producing extra extra value and it seems that the, all the IT's uh, global companies are, are um, enjoying vast, uh, a vast uh, amount of, of extra gain right now to the to the corona crisis so uh, the main point, the main ask, the main question is: Is the the exploitation, extra exploitation you are pointing at uh, in fascism uh, uh, right now a very important part of the nowadays capitalism, or it's just a marginal marginal aspect of it? That's one thing. And the other question would be still uh, insisting on this. Uh, framework com comparative uh, you are not you're not uh, dealing with any comparison uh, that would put in relation the the reality you are analyzing in germany but uh, i would say that you could uh, maybe uh, could uh, enjoy some profit if you would uh, put uh, the reality analyzed in Germany uh, in 
context of what was uh, going on in America. You are maybe acquainted with the fact that, uh, in fact, the, the, the killing factories uh, put up by the Germans, by the Nazis, were, uh, it seems, uh, heavily influenced by the slaughterhouses uh, in Kansas City in America, and which were, in fact, a, a, a very, some of the very primary uh, uh, examples of the uh, emerging uh, Fordist paradigm in the, uh, let's say, in the extraction of the value in, in, uh, in capitalism. Um, what would you, uh, would you agree with me that uh, this comparison would, uh, would, uh, would uh, make some profit uh, for uh, your thesis? And yes, uh, saying that, in fact, I'm also implying uh, that, uh, that the strictly economical point of view that you are uh, stressing in your analysis is in fact uh, deficient in a way that 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 uh, is not uh, taking into account the fact that the economy you are dealing with is heavily burdened by the fact that there was no market at the time and the the, the products made up by all the German firms were uh, bought by the state, in fact, and there was no, no, no free market that 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 was generally supposed by the Marxian uh, political economy. Uh, okay, thank you. So, if you are finished, I can. Uh... Yes, I finished. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, actually, uh, I love these two questions because this. Uh, idea of alternative modernity, I mean, I think Paxton, uh, Robert Paxton uses it. Uh, it's, it's very attractive for me, so I'll, I'll explain why. Uh, but just to uh, address one, uh, one more time this question of economism, well, Horkheimer once said, and I think he's right in this, uh, uh, for, a, for a change, basically giving uh, economism consists in not giving uh, a too wide uh, a scope to uh, the economy, but a too narrow one. So I, I think it's like uh, I would go into the other direction of expanding this, and I will do so in my answer of how this relates to to the economics. But uh, I would just remind that in the thesis, this is uh, like a self-conscious economism because I'm only uh, adding one only one thing. This concept of super exploitation to some, somewhere in the theories in um, technological change, the other Frankfurt School, where it has not existed. But that being said, um, one of the first things I would start with, with the, the state was not the largest consumer in Nazism, it was the Wehrmacht. And it has to do precisely with this idea of an alternative modernity. So if you see what Hitler uh, did after uh, assuming power, this world creation programs that he is so credited with, it was relieving the six million people, which were actually uh, created by his predecessor, Brüning, who, uh, made, made, who uh, made austerity measures which influenced the uh, bankruptcy of the businesses and created the six million people unemployed. Uh, all of the projects that the Reich did, the Autobahn, for example, served the military purpose, so connecting the East and West with Germany. Volkswagen was part of the Fox, so called Fox Produkte. So you have the Fox uh, refrigerator, the Fox wagons, or you have the Fox and Tanga, the radio. So all of them did not serve a civilian purpose, but a military one. And the, the socialization of the German youth through the Hitler Jugend and through the Wehrmacht was made precisely by this, that the only way that you could consume these products of alternative modernity was basically through the military. And this is why the Wehrmacht was one of the largest consumers in the Reich. And this is a, an important fact because it's, it tells you about, a lot about why the Nazis didn't have any sort of civilian welfare state in their minds. And this is what Paxton talks about when he talks about the alternative modernity. And uh, having this in mind, uh, 
I think it's very also interesting to compare it to the US because uh, I quote the second book by Hitler who was analyzing uh, American Fordism. And what you said about the free market, his idea was yes, there's a huge free market in the US, they can, can, can buy domestically produced cars. We don't have that in Germany. We need more Lebensraum. So you can see how this Fordism that Hitler saw is expanding into his thinking about the Lebensraum. So we have a continuation of this inspired or a, a reaction to American Fordism within the Nazis. It's not just Hitler, it's also Stresemann who opted for a more Atlantic strategy with cooperation with the US over the American debt. So this was something that was here and there, I would say, debat debated on the German right, in the, on the German right wing. So that's what, uh, that, that's what, that, that's what I would say for this uh, sort of alternative modernity. But uh, I think your question goes more into the, um, into the idea why there was not this free market, uh, that the state had to buy everything. Uh, there was a market, but it was not a free market in, in the sense of exchanging goods. Of course, you had the, st the state placing the orders through the five-year plans and the like, but also you had uh, private comp the private sector being actually expanded, even, uh, even against the use of anti-monopoly measures. So I would say that basically, that this was one part of the Nazi economy, not uh, not the whole part, but it was an important part. And the military, and through the military, you have the youth that would uh, socialize itself within the, the Wehrmacht. So um, I would say again that it depends on what uh, we're talking about when we're uh, talking about this economy. But I, I don't subscribe uh, too much uh, uh, in terms of this is a unificatory explanation of fascism. I can, uh, I'm, a bit, I'm a bit losing the track here, uh, but I can return to this question later. Uh, what, uh, what you asked also for me uh, is whether I consider camp labor as a, as a residue of fascism. I do not. I mean, uh, what I wanted was uh, to say that there's not, in the, in the, for example, in the economic zones of today, and in neoliberalism where, for example, John Smith and the USCPAD actually does uh, say that the global production chains today do depend on super exploited labor in the peripheries and the uh, uh, IT companies you mentioned like Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, they also depend on uh, cobalt mining in Africa. They're, they're not disconnected for these sort of companies. And uh, IBM and Foxconn in China is a, is a super example. The IBM also be the same company who provide who provided, uh, which provided uh, the uh, computers, uh, early forms of computers to the SS to sort out uh, Jews from uh, non-Jews, the whole read machines they were called. So it's interesting that there's a continuation there, but it's just a historical one. In terms of labor exploitation, you can uh, arrive at super exploitation through different systems. One of them was Nazism because of the specific, um, and I agree with you on that, with the specific uh, situation it was in. So yes, you could not export products abroad. So yes, you had the war drive from the uh, from the Nazi party, which did in fact influence and did uh, turn those decisions in, into a reality. But it only gave but it only gave the Nazi economy its form. And it, it would not, and that's where Gurlan's argument, for example, is very important. It, the war, the war drive gave it, gave the economy its form but it could not alter the need to create technological advancement that was also uh, taking place at the Weimar Republic. So you need to have continuous technological advancement if you want to produce that sort of rubber, that sort of gas, and those sort of resources that are needed for war or peace time. One of the debates Igor Farben had was whether to, take, to turn Auschwitz into a peacetime factory because they were against actually opening Auschwitz because you could not sell all the rubber and the gasoline in peace time. And only once they would, uh, they were, uh, they made post-war plans also with the Reich joining the European Union, by the way, which was interesting because the German uh, uh, right, Rights Academy with under the SS general called Otto Lindorf was producing such plans for post-war Germany on the assumption that the Reich would continue to live by joining the European Union it was an interesting fact that then they decided to accept the state pressure to create Auschwitz and move their factories. Uh, up east. So this was one of the interesting things that where you see that the war gives you the form of an economy, yes, but you, you need to still invest in technological processes regardless of whether you want them in peacetime and wartime. The question was of the amounts and of the locations of the camps, but there was never a question 
there was never a question as to uh, as to should we uh, in, invest in technological development or not. So that was a dynamic, and I think this is where Google learns and uh, Neumann's argument holds. This is the dynamic that is at work in Nazism at well, as well as in the Weimar Republic. And that same dynamic, I would say, appears in John Smith and this idea that the transnational corporations by developing uh, large and larger technologies, you gave the example of the IT, still then need, uh, even when they receive state aid, because of the outsourced production, they still need uh, cheaper labor in order to sustain the more costly technologies that uh, keep on uh, developing. So I guess those two arguments in the end uh, are not that juxtaposed. So yes, you have uh, forced labor exploitation on the one side in neoliberalism and Nazism in different forms. They lead to uh, different outcomes, but super exploitation, it's something that it's just in, a, in the nature as tendency within capitalism and that is in no way opposed neither to peace nor to war, it's just a tendency, whether it gets in how realized this matter of history. So that's where I would end and yeah, I hope I answered. Please let, let me know if I didn't. Uh, I cannot hear you. Uh, I'm satisfied with your answer, thank you. Uh, Right now, uh, I will also invite the, it seems quite vast public of uh, 25 participants, if anyone has maybe something to ask the candidate, the doctoral candidate, about uh, the thesis presented. No one. No one seems to 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 come out. So I guess uh, uh, nobody wants to put any uh, additional answers. And uh, right now, I will give the word also to the two mentors uh, of the candidate, which were present all the time, not uh, maybe visible uh, uh, on Zoom, but. Uh, uh, attentionally hearing what was said uh, between the members and the candidates. So, please, uh, Nadin Blar has the word. Yes, well, hi. Uh, well, Peter Klepp, it's me who is supervising the co-supervisor of the thesis. We are not technically members of this committee. Uh, we're just a sort of invited, uh, invited guest. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so, um, on behalf of the two of us, I would just uh, first of all express my regret that this is not happening live, that uh, we have to do it in this virtual way. And you know that the English expression for PhD defense is Viva, like Viva Voce. And uh, if there is no moment of life presence that this should have been. There's something uh, wrong, there's something missing. And I regret very much, not only this present occasion, but also that this is likely to happen in the future. And uh, this is a likely mode of, of, of academic work uh, that we have to face now. And there is something very troubling about this. And I also regret that we had, uh, I mean, quite apart from having to do the uh, Zoom, that we had quite some uh, problems, acoustic problems with hearing you. Um, it was very difficult. It was really a frustrating experience. Something that should have been an elated experience <laughs> turned into a um, rather difficult um, experience. And well, finally, I would like to express my pleasure, I think, on behalf of both of us. Um, pleasure of having worked with you over the years. And you were really, a, it's a pleasure of working with someone who is completely committed, um, articulate, erudite, and um, has a very strong sense of purpose in, um, in the study. It, it was a great experience. And I think that the PhD that you presented in the end, it's, it's, it, I think it's a great contribution. It's a great contribution, it's a very serious study of the economic side of, uh, of fascism 
it has made a very valuable contribution to, to knowledge. I'm very satisfied with that. And uh, I would also like to thank the members of the committee yeah. who all read your dissertation very seriously and asked very serious questions, actually tough questions, which is, uh, the way I understand it, is that it shows respect for your work. And uh, this is how a PhD should be. I mean, people being, there being a serious discussion, serious and, and, and serious answers to serious questions. So that's all from my part. Thank you, Dr. Dolar, for his, uh, for his uh, intervention. Right now, uh, we uh, just terminated uh, the, the, this second stage, I would say, of the defense. Uh, I would uh, thank you, the public, for, uh, for following us and uh, ask uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, 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 uh, uh, to cut the connection for, for some, I would say, 10 minutes. Uh, the, the committee members will recede in, uh, uh, to, to, to gain a common decision about the exit of uh, this defense. Uh, I would like also the candidate to, uh, to be patient for 10 minutes time uh, approximately before we uh, will be, uh, uh, we'll be here again to uh, communicate the results of our, of our uh, deliberation. Uh, I would also ask Primoz uh, Krasovic to stay with us, connected, so we will uh, gain the final conclusion. Thank you for, to all for the, this uh, 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 event, and uh, we will be back in 10 minutes. Samo za hipec, javnost in kandidata sem izključila, samo član komisije Primož Krašovec in pa vi ste zdaj povezani. Jaz, se bom, jaz bom tudi snela mikrofon, tako da se pa slišimo znova. Hvala. Mislim, da se bom zdaj kandidata zelo pristrašil, da se rekel, da komisija radi deset minut. Za presora, da ga spustimo. Prosim. Mislim da, je, mislim, da je to in mimo rabno za tehnikalje, ne moramo napisati dokumente, uh, recimo odložiti se moramo, prime, ali bo Primož Kraševec nam diktiral svoje vprašanje ali bo nekladno uh, zapisal, kaj bomo napravili. Tukaj vprašam mogoče človeka iz hiše, kar kaj še? Jaz mislim, da to nič Kot ti zbav, torej rabo, a ne takrat mogoče da piše tudi vprašanje, se je to bo takrat muslo, zelo rokopis. To je treba možno izdravljeni. Ali primoš pozdravi relativno hitro in pride samo na zelo zelo to napisati, vprašanje in podpis, ali pa se mu pošli po pošti. Ampak... Ja, to je še vidi, če pa da lahko. Bože pa že. Kako je to misliš? Kako je to misliš? Jaz še na razpirato. Jaz predlagam, da vi izpolnite ta dokument in ga potem skenirate in ga pošljete po mailu, jaz dopišem svoje vprašanje, da dam podpis in ga vrnem TV. V redu. Zame je spešljivo. Jaz mu ne izstilo. Da dobiš odbava, da imaš vzdele. Naši fakulteti vse podpisujemo na elektronsko podpisujemo. Se to skrem za tehnikalijo. Kako pridobiti podpis, bo seveda podpis odsotnega člana, bo seveda fizičen, ali tudi ne. Kako pridobiti vprašanje in podpise odsotnega člana? Mislim, da se mi ne pošli. 
Velja, potem bom ponovil. Tiva, torej zadolženja za reševanje tehničnih vprašanj, pravi, da je mogoče najbolj primerno način rešitve tega ta, da tebi pošle prazen formular za vpis vprašanj, da ti vpišeš svoje vprašanje v tipkani obliki in jih bo prepisala v formular, ki smo ga mi ročili. Priložila, priložila bo tvoje vprašanje. Ne, da je to sprejemljivo. Stran s podpisi bo pa poskenerala, ki se boš gor podpisal in nazaj poslal skem. Ne, to ni se vse priloče. Ok, je bilo. Ja, ok. Je to srej? Jaz. Primoš. Primoš, da se strinjaš s tem? Strinjam se. Dobro, potem nadaljujemo s podpisi tukaj, koliko jih je pač potrebno, jaz moram svoje vprašanje še napisati. Ta vidva podpisala, kar sta imela za napisati, smo vsi podpisali. Tule, 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 tule imamo podpise še. To še malo za vidu. Nikje je bilo podpisala, nikje, 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 mislim, da je rekla, da se to podpiše. Tako se rima pod kongregacija. Moramo sprejeti sklep. Je odločila in sprejela sklep, da kandidat je dosegel, kakšen sklep se sprejme. To je predlaga, to je eno možnosti in to je te možnosti, jo jaz predsedujoči predlagam. Kaj pravi ta člana? Primoš? Bom še ponovil tisto, kar sta kolega tu povedala v prostoru, pa primoš ti izpišal. Tri možnosti so, ali da je bil neuspešen, ali da je bil uspešen, ali pa da je bil uspešen s kumar na vse. Suma kontakte. Aha, jaz sem se uspešen. Jaz mislim, glede na tekst, čeprav zagovor je bil impresivnejši od teksta, ampak mislim, da tekst ni za kumlavde, je pa uspešen. Jaz se tudi s tem srednjem, tako da bomo napisali v sklep, da je torej, če ga še zdaj, da je manj, da je zdaj tista. Če pa treba nimi uspeti, To je dekcija z pravilnika kandidata, ki se stajaca uspešno zbog. Ja, ampak ti praviš, da tega ni, vendar pa imamo to možnost, kako je. Ni gradacije. Ni gradacije. Kaj je prišlo? 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 Kaj je prišlo?
Да че ти видя нас преди. И съм много че поставя от кога да се направя в себе. Господин Селева, ще направи камера. Той е дребо и мая дяне. Това е Тива. Тива нас най-вършно слиши. Тива, се слишма. Трябва да се слишма. Окей, ще малко чакате, просим. Бом зачела слушчат. Хело, ме слишите? Да. Окей, зачелям слушчат гостя, ки са ще остали, прав? So, we are back in session. Uh, as a president of the committee for the evaluation of the dissertation of Alexander Matkovich, I have the, the honor to communicate that our unanimous opinion was that the candidate was successful in defending his doctoral thesis. And uh, right now, I proclaim to be him to be doctor of philosophical uh, sciences. Congratulations from, uh, in my name. And well, thank you very much. It was an honor to speak today with you. And I think uh, the questions were marvelous. So they helped me also see where the future research can, can take place. And I'm sad that we didn't uh, do this live as Dolar, Professor Dolar says, and I hope to come to Ljubljana at some point so we can carry on discussions at um, another place, so to speak. So thank you once again. But it's, it's a necessary part of the defense to drink a glass uh, of something. So we had, this will have to wait. Yes. So well, thank you to everyone for this uh, successful meeting uh, and, uh, well, uh, hoping to, to be in touch uh, and to have future, future ones that will be uh, as successful and as nice as this one. Uh, have everyone I wish everyone to have a nice day and uh, to the candidate to celebrate in a proper manner the, this success uh, he gained today. Congratulations, best of luck. Thank you very much. And I think we see each other. So, can we keep in touch? Congratulations, Alexander. There are some messages uh, in the chat room. You can check them. <laughs> Congratulations. See, be in touch with you by email. Okay, okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Okay. Bye.